Welcome to another episode of Between the Lines. Today we'll do an analysis of Once Upon a Time, a poem by Gabriel Okara. The speaker of this poem reminisces on a time when people used to be more thoughtful of others, more sincere and honest in their interactions with others. In fact, at the end he reflects on how even he, the speaker, has also become fake and selfish like everyone else. The speaker is speaking to his son, who is still an innocent child apparently. Children are generally honest and frank. They say what is on their minds, unlike adults who tend to be disingenuous, hypocritical, insincere. The speaker wants to relearn this kind of childlike honesty from his son. The poem is a straightforward one, but don't be fooled, there is some difficult diction and some interesting devices to look out for. Let's get in between the lines. First, let's read the poem. Once Upon a Time by Gabriel Okara Once upon a time, son, they used to laugh with their hearts and laugh with their eyes, but now they only laugh with their teeth, while their ice-block cold eyes search behind my shadow. There was a time indeed, they used to shake hands with their hearts, but that's gone, son. Now they shake hands without hearts while their left hands search my empty pockets. Feel at home, come again, they say. And when I come again and feel at home, once, twice, there will be no thrice. For then I find doors shut on me. So I have learned many things, son. I have learned to wear many faces, like dresses, home face, office face, street face, host face, cocktail face, with all their conforming smiles, like a fixed portrait smile. And I have learned, too, to laugh with only my teeth and shake hands without my heart. I have also learned to say goodbye, when I mean good riddance. To say glad to meet you, without being glad. And to say it's been nice talking to you, after being bored. But believe me, son, I want to be what I used to be when I was like you. I want to unlearn all these muting things. Most of all, I want to relearn how to laugh, for my laugh in the mirror shows only my teeth, like a snake's bare fangs. Show me, son, how to laugh. Show me how I used to laugh and smile, once upon a time, when I was like you. The poem starts with once upon a time, a beginning that is often used at the start of fairy tales. He uses this intro because what he is about to describe which is a time when people were more authentic and honest, is now like a fairy tale to him. Also, the once upon a time may suggest that it feels like a very long time ago. Also, it creates a tone of reminiscence, meaning he's looking back at the good old days. Those days are so far gone, he can never return to them. He can never go back to being as honest and truthful as he was when he was younger. And so that time in his life feels like a fairy tale to him now that he is an adult. In the next two lines, the speaker recalls how people used to laugh with their hearts and eyes. This is a metaphor. It means back in the day when people laughed, the laughter was genuine, it wasn't fake. You could see their eyes beaming with real happiness. You could tell that their hearts were glad. The rest of the stanza will give us a contrast. First, the speaker told us what people used to do. Now the speaker tells us what people do today. People laugh only with their teeth. What does this mean? It means when people laugh or even smile, it's just for show. While their teeth might show laughter, their eyes might show a different emotion. In their hearts, they might be sad or angry. Their laughter is not genuine. The word teeth here suggests danger and menace. Why didn't the poet use lips or mouth? He used teeth because they are connected to biting and ripping. Teeth are intimidating. Think about lions and wolves. They use their teeth to rip other animals apart. For some animals, showing off their long, sharp teeth is a good way to intimidate other animals. In the last stanza, these teeth will be mentioned again. Teeth are used here to tell us that some people's laughter can be deadly. Someone can laugh in your face while they are planning to stab you in the back. And then, when you are dead, they will keep on laughing. We see in the next two lines what people do while they laugh. 
The speaker says that while people laugh, their ice block cold eyes search behind his shadow. We have a metaphor here, as the people's eyes are compared to ice. What is the effect of this metaphor? If people have eyes of ice, it means they're cold. They don't care about anyone. They're cold-blooded. We also get some cold alliteration in the ice block cold with the repeated k sound. These cold eyes are searching behind the speaker's shadow. That means people are judging him. They laugh in his face, but really they are scrutinizing and criticizing him, watching his every move. Also, this searching the line speaks of refers to how people search others just to see what they can get from them. So you meet someone for the first time, and instead of trying to get to know them, you're just trying to get something from them. These days, if someone reaches out to you on IG or Meta or whatever the new thing is, your first thought might be, what does this person want from me now? There's always an agenda, always an ulterior motive. In the next stanza, we continue down the same road. Indeed, in the first line here, sounds like it is used to try to convince his son that he's telling the truth, but really he's trying to convince himself that this fairy tale was once a reality. People used to shake hands with their hearts. Again, another metaphor. When do we shake someone's hand? When we have made a deal, when we are in agreement, when we are showing mutual respect. But these days, when someone shakes your hand, it's not with their heart. There is no real respect or agreement. They are just trying to use you to get something for themselves. In the next two lines, the speaker confirms that reality has changed. People are no longer genuine in their interactions. Everyone is so pretentious, so politically correct, so dubious, so untrustworthy. Look at the next two lines. While someone uses their right hand to shake the speaker's hand, with their left hand they search the speaker's pockets. Literally, we see the image of a con, a scammer who is distracting the speaker through talking and handshaking while he actually steals his money. This is actually a popular con and is often a two-man job. But of course, this is all a metaphor. While someone appears to be connecting with you, what they're really doing is trying to use you, take advantage of you. Let's pause here to look at the speaker's position in all of this. Note that he isn't including himself in the group of fake people. He calls them they, as we see in stanzas 1 and 2. Also, he seems to be a victim of these people. They're tricking him. They're stealing his money. They're using him. Why are his pockets empty in stanza 2? It must be because all his money has already been stolen. He's explaining to his son how people have used and abused him. In the next stanza, we see more examples of how the man has been deceived by people. People have told him, feel at home, come again. But when he makes himself comfortable at people's houses and actually show up a few times, by the third time, the door is shut on him. It means people tell him that he's welcome, but really, they're just being polite. They don't mean it. It's like when we see someone on the street and say, hey, how are you? But we move along before they can even reply. We want to sound polite, but we don't actually care about others. We also see a metaphor with the doors being shut on the speaker. The door represents opportunities, friendships, partnerships, and these kinds of things. This means people have promised to work with him, to be his friend, to welcome him into their homes, but they have not lived up to their word. In the end, people turn their backs on him. In stanza 4, the poem shifts. All along, the speaker has been talking about what others have done to him. From stanza 4 to the end, the speaker will now talk about his own fakeness, his own hypocrisy, which he had had to learn from those around him in order to survive in this dishonest world. Look at the first line of stanza 4. So I have learned many things, son. The so here connects the first half of the poem with the second half. It means, because of everything I've explained before, I've had to learn certain behaviors. In other words, I needed to become dishonest and fake as well. I needed to learn to lie, learn to use people so I could survive. Imagine if you were 100% honest with everyone every day. Wouldn't life be very difficult for you? He has had to change from being honest and authentic 
to being fake just so he can manage. He explains this in the next lines. So I have learned many things, son. I've learned to wear many faces, like dresses. Home face, office face, street face, host face, cocktail face, with all their conforming smiles, like a fixed portrait smile. We have a simile and a metaphor here. We have a metaphor in the wearing of many faces, and then we have a simile as he wears the faces like dresses. He has a face for the home, one for the office, one for the street, one when he's a host, one when he's at a cocktail, and all of these faces have their conforming smiles. This means he has a personality for every occasion, for every situation. How can he be himself if he has to be so many different people? This is the main conflict. He wants to be himself, he wants to be genuine, but how can he be genuine in a world like this? Think about how even you have many different faces. Do you talk to your parents the same way you talk to your friends? Do you use the same kind of language with your teacher as you use with your brother or sister? Some of us even have different languages for different situations. Personally, I have many different faces. When I am at home with my wife, I speak Patois, Jamaican Creole. When I am at work, I speak English because I'm an English teacher. When I'm on the streets, I speak Japanese because I live in Japan and most people here don't speak English. When I'm at home, I wear shorts and a t-shirt. When I'm at work, I wear a suit and a nice tie. When I make videos like these, I wear a dress shirt, but I lose the suit and tie. I can't imagine how difficult my life would be if I were to sleep in a suit at home and wear shorts to work, if I should speak in Japanese to my wife or speak in Patois to my students at school. Even if we don't want to admit it, we have many different faces. But it gets worse than that. I often have to smile at people who I dislike. I say, it's okay, when it's actually not okay. I say, sorry about that, when I mean, serves you right, it should have been worse. I say, good morning, when there is nothing good about the morning. The ability to be fake, to wear many faces, is actually a necessary skill in today's world. And so while the speaker is frustrated that he has to play this game, he knows that he must keep playing. We have another simile at the end of the stanza. His different faces each have a smile like one you'd see in a portrait, in a painting of someone's face. These smiles we see in portraits, in pictures, are often fake, forced. Similarly, interactions with people are fake and forced. They are rehearsed. What does he mean by conforming smiles in the stanza? He means the smiles are used so that he can fit in with everyone else. We follow the crowd. We do and say what others expect of us so we can be accepted. We even sometimes betray our own opinions and beliefs just so others will accept us. Before we go down to stanza 5, note that repetition is a recurring device throughout this poem. In the first few stanzas, they is repeated as the speaker criticizes not himself, but society. From stanza four down, I is repeated, as the speaker takes accountability for his own actions. He admits that he has become just like the people he was criticizing. Also, in the earlier stanzas, phrases are repeated to show the contrast between what used to happen and what happens now. In the first stanza, we see that they used to laugh with their hearts, and now they laugh with their teeth. In stanza 2, we see that they used to shake hands with their hearts, and now they shake hands without their hearts. Look at how many times heart is repeated. The reason is, all of the modern behaviors display a kind of heartlessness. Let's jump down to stanza 5. We see that the same behaviors that he is disgusted by in the earlier stanzas are behaviors that he has learned. He now laughs with his teeth and shakes hands without his heart. It is like he is confessing to his son that he is now one of the bad guys, but he really wants to become honest again. Moving on, we see that he has learned to say goodbye when he means good riddance. We say good riddance when we are glad to get rid of something or someone. But even when he is glad to get rid of a person, glad to end a conversation, he says goodbye to be polite. We also see that he says glad to meet you, even when he isn't glad to meet someone. And he says it's nice talking to you after being bored. So he has mastered the art of being dishonest, politically correct, 
even when it means lying. We're almost done. In the next three lines here, the speaker yearns to be as honest as he used to be, as honest as his son now is. We can hear the tone of yearning, even of despair, as he says, believe me, son. He just wants to unlearn the muting things. What does that mean? Mute means silent, voiceless. Now he doesn't have a voice of his own. He can't be himself because he has to conform to society. He can't speak his mind. He can't be honest. He wants to unlearn these behaviors and go back to the childlike honesty that his son possesses. We see a lot of repetition in I, which shows the speaker's desperation to fix himself. The muting things is a metaphor, by the way. It means conforming to society, being politically correct, being too polite, actually takes away your voice, your personality, your identity. Things get more intense in the next few lines. When he looks in the mirror, he sees that when he laughs, it is not just teeth that show, but snake fangs. This wonderful simile compares the speaker to a snake. Snakes are often linked to deception. A snake deceived Eve in the Garden of Eden. And from then, snakes have been seen in this light. Calling someone a snake is saying that they are deceptive, they are a liar, they are sneaky. When the speaker laughs in the mirror, what he sees is a liar. Finally, we are at the last stanza. The man begs his son to show him how to laugh and smile the way he used to. Again, we see once upon a time, which reinforces the idea that the speaker's past self is so far removed from his present self that the past self is now like a fantasy to him, like a fairy tale. We have an irony in the last stanza, as the father is asking the son to teach him, when usually fathers are supposed to be the ones teaching their sons. How can we understand the conclusion of the poem? Does the man actually unlearn the dishonesty and become honest again? Well, we don't know. But what we do know is that he at least recognizes his own flaw. He recognizes that the problem of fakeness, of deception, of insincerity is not just a societal problem, but a personal problem. He's aware of this and he wants to change. But can he change? If he does return to his childhood honestly, will he be able to survive in this world? And as always, thanks for watching.